Hello. Justice for Barb. <laughs> Justice for Barb. Oh my gosh. Uh, are we separate? Is this weird? Okay, that's good. Uh, hey everybody. Okay, so when we were told that we were, you know, we were invited here to come talk to you guys, I mean, we were really excited and, and we were trying to figure out, you know, what we wanted to talk to you guys about and we just thought about, we started really young, so we want we, we wanna tell you the kind of things that we wish, you know, maybe someone had told us when we were your age. But then we started going, but wait, they're in a different situation. They got to the White House, okay? Like they made movies that got them invited to the White House. That is incredible. You do not need to listen to, you don't need any advice. I think you're doing just fine. But uh, we're gonna talk anyway. We're gonna talk anyway, because we're here and we, we have to talk. Uh, so hopefully something we say is useful and you know, we've seen your movies and, and you know, I mean, what we can tell is you guys are all like super gifted storytellers and specifically visual storytellers and so you are our tribe and you're awesome and I'm sure you know for all of you there was something out there that that made you want to do this and, and so sort of we've been going back and racking our brains and seeing what was it that made us want to do this and, and you know we we're thinking about the first movie we saw but it's hard to remember we have like blurry memories of Dumbo which may have been it Dumbo's great, so I hope it was. Yeah. But I remember that, I think the fir our first movie-going experience, that I remember, uh, our, we were three years old, and our dad took us to see The Princess Bride. I don't know if any of you have seen that movie. Have you seen it? Yeah. It's great, right? It's, it's like funny. A, it's, yeah, it's oh, That was loud. Yeah, it's, it's a classic. It's so funny, but when we were three, it, it wasn't funny to us at all. In no. fact, it, it, was, it was terrifying. Uh, you know, these, the, the giant rats came on screen and we were just like, that's, that's enough, Dad, we're out of here. And we ran, we ran away. So our first movie-going experience, we didn't even finish the movie. Uh, we were sensitive children, right? We were sensitive, yeah, but, but, but it was, we still loved it because it was so transportive. Like, like we were in this, suddenly, like, in this, in this amazing, incredible um, fantasy land and we felt like, you know, like we were really, really there. And so that was kind of when we fell in love with movies and then we started to discover all these classics. We watched Jaws and... Uh, you know, and E.T. and Batman, and we fell in love with all the, these filmmakers and the worlds that they, they took us to, and we decided that, you know, that this was something that we wanted, you know, we wanted to do and we wanted to pursue. Um, yeah, and I think we were in the third grade, and our parents gave us um, a Hi8 uh, video camera. I don't know if you know what Hi8 is. It, there's probably like a filter out there now that makes it look like that, like it makes it look bad. Uh, <laughs> But it, it, for us back then, it, it looked it looked it looked great. It was high tech. We thought we were the coolest kids, and we started making movies. And the first movie we made was called uh, "The Stuffed Father," and it was about stuffed animal mobsters who went around killing each other. Uh, and the second movie we made was called "The Stuffed Father Part Two. Uh, yeah. And the third movie we made was "The Stuffed Father Part Three. Wait, that was the worst. One. Yeah, we yeah. did that one. Yeah. We did that for the money, really. Yeah. Uh, and needless to say, the Stuff Father trilogy, as epic as it was, did not get us invited to the White House. Sadly. Yeah. No, but we're no. over it. We're definitely we're over, over it. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and then after that, we just kept making movies every summer. We made uh, a feature-length adaptation of Magic: the, the Gathering. We just made movies about stuff that we were really interested in. We did not have girlfriends no. at the time. No. <laughs> No, we didn't. Uh, um, and then we did a movie about a stuffed animal monkey that got possessed by a demonic force and killed people. I don't know what her thing was with stuffed animals Killing and killed people. people, but it was something that we were into. And then we did, you know, for, for I remember a class project we did. We want, we recreated the, the storming of Normandy, and we had kids on rafts with, with squirt guns. And then we took this sound from Saving Private Ryan and put it over, <laughs> over this image, and it made it epic. And they're still showing that to this day. We got an, an A+. Plus. Yeah. So I guess if, you, if yeah. you get nothing out of this, at least like if you take Academy Award winning sound and put it over your project, <laughs> you're gonna get an A potentially. You know. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, as we were making these movies, um, you know, we were just we were making more and more every year, and we we learned every year, and we didn't, but we didn't see it as learning because we just we loved it so much. It just felt like the most natural thing in the world. And, and over time. Uh, uh, oh, over time, you know, these movies started to actually become, what would you say, I'd say watchable, they were watchable, yeah. uh, which we thought was like a huge achievement. We're like, maybe we can actually do this uh, for real, but I'm sure like a lot of you, uh, you know, we're from North Carolina and, and Hollywood felt really far away from us and the film industry just felt like this other galaxy. And so what we ended up doing is we went to film school in California, but I don't think, and that's a fine path, I don't think it's, what we've learned is that it's not a necessary path. I think the key is just to keep making things 
uh, and doing what what you love. And, and that's you know obvious as this might sound, it's just not not to give up. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, it, and it, I mean, it is. I mean, it's really hard because I remember, you know, we, you know, when we graduated from college, and then we went around and we started to pitch ideas that we had, and pitching, you know, I don't, know if you know what it means, but you're trying to sell, you're trying to get someone to believe in your story and to make make your story. So you're going to all these studios and producers, and you're pitching, and you know, all we got was no, 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 and like people are super rude in Hollywood, so you just get, you have to, you, you have to, like, there's just, it's just it's a ton of no's and a lot, and a lot of rejection because you come out really excited, and then it's just, just doors getting get, getting slammed in your face over and over again and we started to freak out a little bit because it felt for a moment it felt like actually um, it felt impossible and I remember you know we were even walking by a Starbucks and going I don't you know get barista jobs are hard to get in LA you know so like they're very they're very coveted so it was like I don't even think we can get this job um, and and there was a, I don't want to freak parents out I mean I, <laughs> I encourage you to, good to move to LA and follow your dream but it was scary it was a scary time um, yeah, and so what we did, we're like, okay, instead of pursuing those very difficult barista jobs, what we're going to do is we, we, we had like a month of money left, and we huddled in our small apartment, and we decided to do something we hadn't done, which is like, we're just going to write something that we would want to see, not what we think other people want or what other people think is cool or what's the in thing in the industry right now. We're like, let's just write something for ourselves. And that script ended up selling to Warner Brothers. Amazing, right? It's like the, one of the you know, greatest studios uh, in, in history. It was like our dream come true. We got to make this movie. We were so happy. And then Warner Brothers didn't really like the movie. And ended up getting see, you thought, you thought we were at the uplifting part, and we're not. We're not there yet. We're still like on the, in the dumps. And so the Warner Brothers didn't like the movie, and they didn't release it, and like very few people saw this movie, and we just we just felt terrible. Yeah, but we're we're, we're over definitely it. over it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're yeah we're over it. And and so I guess why we're telling you all this is just because I just wish someone had told us how 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 brutal and how and how hard of a how hard of a road it is. Um, and you know, and especially when you're when you're doing you know something creative because you're putting something out that's very personal, that's create you know personal to you, that means something to you. And when people say they don't like it or they reject it or they say no, it feels it feels like someone's personally attacking you. It feels like a like a stuffed animal monkey is like repeatedly stabbing you or whatever. So so uh, and, and I wish some and I wish I had known that. And you know, I mean, I, I think it's important to just. Um, you know more you know more than anything to keep going but if you don't if you don't love it like specifically if you don't love the act of of making it if that doesn't get you the satisfaction that that you need to keep going then stop like I, I would stop right now but I feel like the fact that you're here the fact that you made these films and enter these competitions and you're at the White House you're not gonna take knows for an answer you're not gonna you're gonna, when they, someone shuts the door you're gonna open it again they're gonna shut it you're gonna open it again um and and that's the kind of attitude i think that right and, that, and that's how we felt in terms of after we you know we had rejection then success and then rejection again and then so we just huddled back in our small apartments and we came up with a new story we want to tell in this one uh was for a tv show and involved a, a young kid in the 1980s who went was kidnapped by an interdimensional monster, and his friends and family uh, go looking for him. And we were so excited about this idea. It was what we had wanted, what we wanted to see. And then we started pitching around, and everyone was like, "That's a terrible idea," because you know they're like, "You, you can't." It, it's a, it's has kids as leads, but it's not specifically for children. Uh, and why is it in the '80s? No one cares about the '80s anymore. And so. Again, we started getting those no's that we got at the beginning of our career, which is just door slamming our face. No, 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 no. Uh, but we kept pitching around. Eventually, this little company called Netflix heard about it. We went in there, and you know, we just pitched our hearts out, and then we uh, crossed our fingers. And then, you know, a year and a half later, which is really fast uh, for Hollywood, you know, Stranger Things was out in the world. And then two months after that, we finally made it to the White House. Yes, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, no, I, so I guess the reason, the reason, you know, we're telling you all this is, is to try, is as much as possible, tell stories that mean something to you, that matter to you, move, you know, tell stories that you want to see out in the world. And I know it sounds easy now, but as you get out there in Los Angeles or New York, it, it actually becomes, uh, it's very easy to kind of kind of lose your way. I mean, there, there's um, that that the phrase you know chase your dream, and I think it's actually like I, I don't think you should chase your dream at all. I think um, 
Um, you know, you should chase the feeling that you have when you're making these movies, the way that makes you feel when you're making something that, that you love, that, that you should chase that feeling. And I really believe if you do that and stay true to yourself and just stay, stay true to that, that, that the dream will then follow. So um, what, what I, in whatever kind of stories you guys want to tell, whether it involves, uh, you know, possessed stuffed animal monkeys or interdimensional monsters, or even if it's about changing the world, whatever it is, I just know that we're excited to see it. So uh, congrats that you're all here. And now uh, we're going to invite, right? Yeah, our two amazing Intre producers, intrepid producers uh, yeah. Dan Cohen and Sean Levy, who the show wouldn't exist without them. Hi, guys. Hello. We did not prepare any speech, although yes to everything they just said. Um, but did you have any questions about the show or about kind of where you're heading in your filmmaking, storytelling lives and careers? We are here to answer anything you might have. I, I will say just one anecdote. What's great about kind of this time that we're living in is that two brothers from North Carolina can be filled with the urge to tell a story and they can find a way to tell it. And that there's kind of this democratization of storytelling and you know, there's a way to make your story, there's a way to put your story out into the world and you know, Dan Cohen and I, we have a company called 21 Laps and it started off you know, 10 years ago, because I made those Night at the Museum movies. And, uh, and then we decided a few years ago that we want to, uh, we want to find other storytellers with different kinds of stories. Maybe it's a comedy, maybe it's creepy, maybe it's set in the 80s, we didn't know. And uh, Dan Cohen came across this script and the Duffer Brothers and, uh, and literally came into my office and says, you need to stop what you're doing, you need to read this script, because there is something special here. These are voices that, need to be heard. And, you know, as you guys said, a year and a half later, here we are. And so, um, certainly, it is as hard as the Duffers described, but can I tell you also, especially to the young people here, it's worth it. Like, don't even tell everyone outside this room, but there is actually and a way. they're live streaming this channel. Oh, crap. <laughs> are they really live streaming? All right, well, now the secret's out. Um, but I did want you to know, like, when you, in your kind of young adolescent mind, or even pre-adolescent mind, think about, wow, wouldn't it be awesome to build a life around being creative? And so many grown-up forces are saying, well, that's almost impossible. Don't do that. But it is possible, and it is as great a life as you imagine right now. And we are proof. So um, keep doing what you're doing. If, do you have any questions or anything? Or anything we can tell you about how the show? Yes, hi. You got test, test. Any hints for like season two? <laughs> I literally have gotten to the point where I'm scared to talk because I feel like I'm a walking spoiler risk because um, I have a big mouth. Um, I don't think we're... It's a year later. We can say that. We can say that a year later. Because uh, the kids are growing up, so it had to be. <laughs> we would love to stop them from growing, but... Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I hate to say anything because it just, it just, it's going to, it'll, it'll, you know, it'll ruin anything. But but there's an, it, you know there's another there's a, the portal to another dimension is, is still um, are we saying it's still, that it's still is open that, oh we're yeah, saying that I'm okay saying, I think it's when did they it's close it still open <laughs> I guess they never close it so that's an issue it's definitely a problem um, <clears throat> you know what occurs to me is that maybe the best way to kind of give you a real vivid example of the passage of time would be to show you how time has passed already because we have a special guest with us here you know her as eleven. But here is Millie Bobby Brown. You want to see sit here? There's a mic. So now I bet you have questions. Hello. Oh. Hello. I'm mic-less. What they said, I don't really have a speech planned, but they all say the right things, so. Maybe if you keep asking questions, well, I, now I'm really scared about spoiler risks on this stage. But um, yes, back there in the hat. Uh, how long did it take to write the script for the first season? All of the scripts are just, I mean. What did you write it at one time? We just, we wrote the pilot and that's what we went to Netflix with. So we had the first script, which it stayed pretty much the same throughout. Mm -hmm. Some stuff was, I think Barb was killed in the pilot. Though. In the pilot. In the pilot, yeah. Yeah, we were even more brutal. 
to her in the pilot. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah, no. And th th so I think I think overall it took us about uh, four uh, a week, a uh, month maybe to to write the script and come up with the the concept. And then and then we, we developed like a, a lookbook, um, you know, to show kind of what the, the 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 show would look like. And then we made a fake trailer where we it was like two minutes long where we combined clips from. Uh, a bunch of different movies to make it look like our show, and then that helped people see what it was or that's what we worth, wanted it to be. That's worth kind of just sharing with you guys. Yeah. It used to be even five years ago that if you wanted to like break into Hollywood, you'd write a script, you'd make a short film, and you would send it out and hope that someone responded. Now, I mean, Dan Cohen and I at our company, when people come in with a script, like like we did, like the Duffers did with Stranger Things, usually they've also put together either like a PDF slideshow of images that give you a sense of the tone or the look. These boys did a lookbook and like a fake trailer. And what I think is remarkable is, on the, I remember this because it was on my desk, on the cover of the lookbook that they did in their apartment while they were contemplating barista jobs. Yeah. Um, was an image of an abandoned 80s bicycle on a small town road. And that that image, from the first day before we even knew we were gonna get to make this thing, that was like a central iconic image. And now if you look at our posters and you look at everything about our show, it's kind of remained at the heart of the mixture of innocence and creepy that Stranger Things is about. It felt like forever though, because when you guys wrote episode seven and we was filming it, and I was like, when is episode eight coming out? Mm. And you guys would be, it's like, we're just, we're just finishing it up. And I'd be like, but it's taking so long. So it finally yeah, came yeah. through. I mean, we were writing all the way through, you know, all the way through uh, production. Out of, respect, out of respect to these guys, though, one thing we learned was a year to the day from when Netflix bought um, what was just the pilot in their presentation, we wrapped production of the entire show. So even though some, only so much could be written at some point, it, they were constantly doing everything and it was a full on sprint to that point. So it was, it was, an, it was amazing to see and be a part of. Yes. Um, I'm 65 and I'm pretty uh, picky about the things I watch, but Stranger Things really brought me in and your performance really twisted my heart. <laughs> it was so exceptional. Thank you so much. Portraying a real normal girl who has undergone with these powers and the abuse, this terrible abuse, and still open, vulnerable, and willing to use it and, and be strong. I was really, I really like the show. Thank you so much. Um, you in the glasses? Hi. Um, I was just, uh, well, first of all, I love Stranger Things so much. Thank you. Um, but I was wondering what you thought about the chances of women in the film industry, like as storytellers. I mean, no, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I think it's the question, it, 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 for, if you didn't hear, just kind of yeah. the issue of women in the film industry and kind of where we're at with that and what we think about it. Well, I think, I mean, obviously, if you look at the percentages, it's depressing, really. But my wife, for instance, is is a filmmaker, um, and she's you know. So I think that there's there's this group. First of all, the industry is being more and more open to it, and then also that I think there's this amazing, talented uh, group of women filmmakers, and they're just more and more every day, and they're just breaking down these barriers. And I think it's not just in terms of directing, it's writing, it's cinematography, it's all these. Uh, areas that have so for so long been so dominated by men that I think that those barriers are just coming down more and more every day. So, um, let's go you, and then we'll do the two behind you. Hi, yes, you, ma'am. Um, if you if for this for the Duffer Brothers, um, could you guys elaborate on how um, you guys got a meeting with uh, Netflix? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, we, so yeah, it kind of worked. It, it was, it's kind of weird. I, I mean, this could be like an hour long thing. I'll, I'll shorten it. But like we, yeah, we sent the script to a bunch of producers and, you know, and these, you know, Dan and Sean really loved the project. They were very passionate about it. So we, um, we decided to work with them on the project. And then, um, and then basically we went around and we went around with Dan and we pitched to a bunch of studios and somehow it was about a week. And then all of them said, no, not interested. I mean, I remember our agent called us at the end of that week and he was like, he said, you know, it's a special project and we're gonna find a special home for it. 
And I was like, what's wrong with her? Our child. Our child, yeah. Is it special? What's special about it? Um, and, then, and then I think some, like someone uh, had a breakfast meeting with... Um, Where's Matt the Right over yeah. there. That guy over there from Netflix. From Netflix. It wasn't about our project. It was about something else entirely. And he happened to mention that they were looking for something um, that had, you know... Uh, youths, uh, young characters in major roles, and that was maybe supernatural. And he goes, oh, I have the perfect project for you. Um, there's this, there's this um, script called Stranger Things that the Duffers and 21 Laps, Sean and Dan, are producing, and he gave it to them, and they, they read it over the weekend, and they were interested. And we got our meeting. And that's yeah. how it happened. But we didn't even we had it. We didn't even send it to Netflix. And I think that's the thing about the industry. It's like there is, there's, a la there's an element of, of luck involved. Um, I mean, there's talent, but then there's also, like, just getting it into the... I mean, there's, there's just so many things that had to go right for it to end up in Netflix that just... Some of it's just pure coincidence, and anyway. Like, right, that they happen to be looking for that kind of project. That kind we of had pro no idea. That, no. Of course, we, you can't know that kind of thing. And so, um, yeah, I mean... But that's why I think it's the, the simplest thing is just to write what you want and hope, because this is not something that anyone wanted. We had no idea Netflix wanted this. It just... I think if you write what you love, and then you just... I mean, I'm sure it won't always find a home, but I think those t you're just as likely to find a home than is if you try to uh, calculate it, you know, do a calculated script that you think will sell. And in the world of, of TV, it's you, you often have a studio and a network and a lot of people working towards something and it can get watered down. And we were lucky to have a situation where it was the four of us uh, and our great Netflix executives seeing very eye to eye and moving on a very quick, you know, uh, straight to series order so we got to make exactly what the duffers you know what else to. though is worth knowing guys is that what one thing that is really noteworthy about the duffers is every time there's a choice to make they go with their gut every time and that's when they were picking a producer for the show when they were picking our actors like we, you can imagine we saw well over a thousand actors for every you know all the roles but especially these kid roles and some of them would be really good but at every decision, if the Duffers, the Duffers would say like, yeah, that kid's good, or that kid's very experienced, but if their gut wasn't telling them that it was the right way to go, we would keep looking. It's how we hired our production designer. It's how we hired our composers who did the music that's gotten so much attention. At every stage, the Duffers just followed what their gut told them, and that's generally good advice for your futures. Yeah, to build on that, actually, you're all young storytellers here, and when we started talking to the Duffers, what was very apparent is they were fluent in the books and films and stories that were influential on Stranger Things, and it clearly came from decades of love and hard work um, to the extent of what Sean's talking about, where any decision they had to make from story to hiring someone, their gut was always right, and they had a full knowledge of what this world of Hawkins, Indiana was. So, you know, beyond, continue to make shorts and, and continue to read and watch everything and influence the worlds that you want to one day make and then you'll be able to make all the right calls like these guys did, basically. I promise someone back there, yes, you, buddy. What, what do you think about uh, film school and like, what would you say? The question is what do we think uh, about film school versus not film school? That, I mean, that's a really hard one. I'm sure all, I get asked that question once a week. Um, what is, where do you come I out mean, on my, I don't know how you, I mean, my feeling is, what's good about it is that it just puts you with a bunch, it's not about the teachers, really. Uh, it's about putting you, sorry, it's, not, it's about putting The teachers you, are awesome if they're in this room. <laughs> teachers are so critically important if you're listening to our words right now. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that the key is that it's putting you in a space where there are a bunch of other kids that want to do what you want to do. And you all learn from each other and you make mistakes and you grow. What I'm saying is that I don't think you necessarily, it doesn't have to be a film school to, be an to find yourself in an environment with a bunch of other people that want to do this. I will say no one looks at a resume and is like, oh, he went to USC. Wow, let's hire this person. Everybody went to, you know what I mean? Are they, well, not us. U U USC rejected us. NYU rejected us. This is the rejection thing. We're over it now, though. Yeah, we're you know? totally <laughs> over it. But, uh, you yeah, know, and then we ended up going to Chapman University, and it kind of didn't matter. You go to a place, and, it, it, you know, it was nice to be around people who loved doing what we were doing. We were from North Carolina. We were, we were the only people interested in doing it. But if you can find that group of people to practice, I mean, the most important thing is, is, is to just, just keep making stuff and just having fun doing it. It's so easy, actually, when you think about it. I think people make it so much more complicated than it is. They, re they write books about breaking down story structure and all this stuff. That All that stuff throws you off. Like, the best thing for me that you can do 
is just watch, I mean, it's the coolest homework assignment ever. Just watch stuff, anything that you're interested in. Go to the movie theater, whatever you love. Just keep watching it. And then also just live your life. Because I think you get a lot of, just live your life. Um, you know, Watch movies. Watch movies, more movies. TV play video shows. games. Like, all of that stuff I think is a positive. Video games, yeah. I Maybe said video like, games. Uh, I think video games are good. They influence, you know, they, you know okay. I, think, I, I think everything we did in our life was, very, was really positive. Um, um, Matt, and talk about like, Silent Hill. And f yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, but do good in school. I mean, really. <laughs> well, you know, at school though, I think it was important though in that we it taught us work. It, it gave us a really strong work ethic, and I think that what that was important. Um, and I think we worked re really, really hard in school, and the discipline. Because uh, it's hard, hard even when it's like important. we didn't have like we didn't have that barista job, but it's like getting uh, you still have to get up early every morning and sit down in front of that blank page, and you ha and you, you have to set you know you have to work until you do have to work harder than everybody else. We were working at night, and you're just working you know every day super hard, even when when that maybe it seems impossible. And so I think that that's you know how you knew at film school I knew who was going to make it, and not because. The kids, there was a small group of kids who were there all night, every night. You know, who were there at night. It was like four or five kids, and the other kids were like sleeping. Good for them. But they didn't, the kids who were sleeping didn't make, you know, a lot of the kids who were there, all, you saw all the time. Yeah. The kids who were there all the time, who you saw all the time, every day, who were working the hardest, tended to be the most successful. Because, guys, this is the thing. Wanting it, okay, great. That's necessary. It's not the most important beat. So wanting it, great. Everybody wants it. A lot of people who aren't even in this room want it. Having talent, that's if you're lucky, that's necessary. But if you don't put the want and the talent with just the straight up work, it will almost certainly not happen. It doesn't happen accidentally. These guys ground it out. And we as a team on Stranger Things, we worked so hard. We had no idea if even five people were going to watch it. So you've got to put the want and the talent with the work. That's critical. Yeah, and that's why I was saying you gotta love it because it is so much work that you have to love the doing of it. You don't have to love every minute of it, but you have to generally love what you're doing. Yeah, that's got to give you enjoyment just because it is so much work. Um, uh, oh my gosh, now we got, oh, and he, you're standing. I feel like I gotta go with the guy who stood up for it. But I'm coming back your way. I think we're okay on time. Yes, sir. Talking about the school, I could recommend the one school that we all have to go through. The school of hard knocks. <laughs> yeah. So yes, the one school most of us have to go through is the school of hard knocks, which the brothers told you about. They, you know, they're young filmmakers, but they came to this moment having gone through some hard knocks, and it definitely teaches you grit, and it definitely teaches you appreciation. Yes, sir. Uh, so I know this is a film festival, but I also like to make uh, a lot of music. And people think it's really weird that I like to go and listen to my own music. And so my question for all of you is like, do you really enjoy like going back and watching all your stuff all the time? Like the question is, do we enjoy going back and watching our own work or listening to music that we made or a film that we made? Millie. Yeah. Um, it really depends. See, with this show, I did kind of want to watch it because it just intrigued me anyway. So I was like, oh, you know, Winona Ryder, and it's like, I have to watch it. So. But like with my other projects, you know, I, I, I did like, I did, I did enjoy watching it because I do like watching the other actors perform because I didn't always get to watch it when, like when we was actually on set. So it was actually really fun to watch it on screen and to see what, you know, the Duffers would tell me things and I wouldn't process it. My, I'd be like, you don't, you're not making any sense, but I'll do it anyway. And then when I'd do it, and then I'd see it on screen, I'd be like, wow, that made a difference for me just to like look away or something. So it's really nice to see all the little things gather up and then uh, be shown on screen. So I did think I really liked it, watching my show. Yeah, but I think it's important to go to watch your, to watch your work. I mean, I can't watch the show anymore. Like, I'm done with it. But like, <laughs> I think it is important, like when you're working on stuff, to keep going through it over and over. And be, you need to be your harshest critic. When We're you, harder yeah. on ourselves than anyone else is. When you us. see your own mistakes, you do not make that mistake again. Someone can tell you about it in a film class. You can hear about it in critique. But when you see your own mistake, make your own work a little less good. It, but you it's do hard because I'm like, wa I watch it and I'm not really enjoying it. I'm like, oh, that was t stupid. Like, why did we do that? Or I would change that or whatever. But I think that you know who I know. I how know when people aren't going to make it. They're like, oh man, this is perfect. I, I made this is great. What I just made. Like, I love this. I'm a genius. You know what I mean? Like, then you're 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 in trouble. I'm telling you. Unless you're you, Kanye or something. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but you gotta, you gotta, like, I mean, I, it's important. I, when, when people, the people I'm, we're surrounded with who are the most talented are the ones who are the hardest on themselves. And I think you do have to be hard on yourself. Not, not to the point where you can't get up out of bed to do the work, but, like, you need to be hard on your own work in order for it to get there, in order for it to get better. Um, so I think it is important. Um, let me just do this side. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you talked about some of the influences, books, movies, TV shows, but would you share specifics that you thought about? Because I know when I watched yeah. the, the first episode, there were a couple of things that came to mind. And also, if they had you, Millie, if you watched any of these things. When yeah, we made you, you watch a bunch all. of movies. <laughs> what did we make you watch? Um, hmm? You made me watch quite a lot, and it was actually quite hard because I I'm oh, just I don't understand I don't understand I you mean yeah GT, but the thing is is that I'm not like guys. that see Finn and all the other boys they could sit there through a movie and they could just not speak see I would be like what does that mean so so like you guys made me watch the Goonies You're the reason people don't go to movies anymore because you just talk what did you say much. nothing never mind uh. um <laughs> Um, but no, the Goonies. What else? Uh, Poltergeist. Uh, Stand by uh, me. Did Stand you watch Stand by Me, or is that just the boy? No, I, I had to watch that. I mean, Stand to see me. the actual friendship that they had, like, was incredible. But then, but then also like E.T. because of my character. So, I watched them prior anyway. Like, I'd already watched them, and then when I got that reel with all the movies, um, like, cut down and sort of watched like a trailer for the show, I was like, sign me up. <laughs> But I, yeah, I'm trying to give it the different influences. I mean, it was like a bunch of Stephen King books. Uh, I mean, Stephen King's Spielberg movies, it, it John Carpenter is all movies. over it. The John Carpenter um, it is all over in terms of Halloween, um, Wes Craven, Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, oh, sorry. You know, some video games like Silent Hill. I said video games. Um, I'm trying to think. Those are some of the big. Those are some of the. But you know, Steven Spielberg and Stephen King are kind of like we like the idea of kind of smashing. It's like what if Spielberg made like a, a, a Stephen King adaptation? That was kind of that was the the initial um, the initial idea. So those are kind of our two biggest. I think a, a big part of why this has struck a chord is we can all feel and see the influences, but it is original, and it's come out at a time where you know the market is more and more riddled with remakes and sequels, and to kind of uh, distill what's so great about those old movies and stories that we really like it, but to put it onto something that no one's ever seen before, I, th I think is really exciting. And I hope that can be influence other filmmakers and other stories that get told, because we certainly enjoyed making it. And it sounds like people really liked and responded to it, so. I think we can do a couple more questions, guys. Yes, sir. Uh, in the first draft of the, of the show, did you envision having CGI like they have in the show? Or did you envision more of props? Or the question is, when we started off making it, did we envision, how did we think would be the balance between practical effects and computer-generated effects? And how did that evolve? Because there really was an evolution. When yeah. we, I mean, go ahead, Matt. Oh, no, well, yeah, we wanted to do as much of it as we could practically. And so, like, we built the, mo I mean, so when you see the monster in the show, I, I don't know, is it like 50% of it maybe is uh, a guy in, in a suit? And then, uh, and then the other 50% is um, CG based off that, like we scanned him or whatever. And so, I mean, no, it's just, it's, tr it, it's tricky and it's tricky particularly we found, realized on a, on a production, uh, on a television production schedule, you don't have months and months to do preparation. So I think we went in a little naive thinking that we could achieve more of it practically and then a lot of that stuff didn't work and we actually ended up changing it to computer graphics in post because it looked, ended up looking yeah, Because on a movie, if a practical effect doesn't work, you can go, okay, you know what, let's take two hours and figure this out and then shoot it again. On a TV schedule, because at the end of the day, even though it feels a bit like an eight-hour movie, we were doing it on a TV schedule. If it didn't work, we didn't have time. We didn't even have 45 minutes to figure it out. We had to go, okay, you know what, we're going to fix this later in post-production. So I think we envisioned 80-20 practical to computer, and it ended up being 50-50. Yeah. Next question? Uh, I, you, sir. acting as intense as you were as like you're so young but yet you're using these emotions that like not even most adults would even feel sometimes so how was that like um it was definitely challenging because well i didn't have any lines and <laughs> i mean how could you not like how can you not express yourself without talking it's it's sometimes it's very hard and and so you have to express yourself without talking <laughs> with your face and you know, so there's some, there would be times where I'd, I didn't know what to do with a scene. I, I, I couldn't 
cry sometimes and I ask the duffers like just tell me something like <laughs> to, to make me cry so and I remember the, the scene where well we, we were filming in Atlanta and it was the most so cold so we would we had done the scene where it, when we found Will's fake body and I couldn't cry that night and I was like literally me and Finn were like oh no <laughs> so the duffers really helped and then when I had the scene where uh, Matthew Modine was carrying me down the hallway Sean Sean and I well Sean mostly said to me I think that um I think we should play music don't play music because I would just ball out crying and it really worked so you just play music to it and it just really adds the emotion so they would help me a lot and then you'd have to go by you know your instinct so it was interesting <laughs> it's very different <laughs> But I, I mean, one thing that is remarkable about Millie, and usually you don't even find this in most adult actors, um, we would sometimes do a scene, and I was there one episode the Duffers were directing where Eleven was in that tent that Mike makes for her in his basement. I remember you did a take, and we were all in a rush, got to go because it's a TV schedule. And I remember Millie, who was, were you like 11 at that point? I mean, in age? Yeah. In, oh, yeah. oh. Um, and, uh, yeah, no, no, uh, in age, yeah. yeah. Right. Well, when, when, but I remember that we were like, okay, cut, moving on. And I remember Millie's like, actually, could I get one more take? I think I have, I think I have something else. And that's really rare for an actor to have the kind of strength to stop and slow down the train to say, I, I think I can do better. But even at this young age, Millie had a sense of her powers and her abilities as an actor. And, uh, and we, who directed the show, were smart enough to follow the talent and the instincts of the performer. And those are the takes that ended up in the show. Thank you. We okay on time, by the way, guys? I have no, no sense. Um, yes, you young. Is that one more? Oh my gosh, guys. But we're, we'll be around maybe a, a bit later, more. so you can hit us up one on one. Yes, you young lady. Um, so this is a question for Ellie. Um, since you're a celebrity, how do your kids at school Question is about now that Millie's a celebrity, how do her kids and friends at school question. treat her? Well, I wouldn't really class myself as like a celebrity. I'm just like 11, you know, from Stranger Things, not, no biggie. Uh, you know, I, <laughs> I don't, yeah, I get recognized, obviously, but I am homeschooled, which is easier. I mean, these guys, they, they're, they're like the, the, the big brothers. They keep me grounded and my family so it's like I'm homeschooled and I don't get to I don't get treated any differently than anybody else and I would never do that and actually coming in here and seeing you guys is so refreshing because I've been kind of in LA and I've been like wow this is incredible but to see you guys you guys are very you know so talented and it's really refreshing to see you guys so it's nice that I can you know be in the spotlight sometimes but it's really nice to come and do things like this and to inspire people but you guys are inspiring me also so thank you thank you right.